Thank you for joining us this evening for the Princeton Theological Seminary Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture. I wish that we could be hosting Dr. Hill in our chapel, which is our tradition for this lecture. However, during this extraordinary season, we're delighted to welcome him tonight on this virtual platform. It's my great honor to be able to introduce you to Dr. Mark Lamont Hill. I want to thank Reverend Kermit Moss, our interim director of Black Church Studies. <clears throat> and I want to thank the Association of Black Seminarians, ABS, under the leadership of Jalen Baker for selecting Dr. Hill as our 2021 lecturer. Dr. Hill is the Steve Charles Professor of Media, Cities and Solutions at Temple University. He has also held positions at Columbia University and at Morehouse College. Dr. Hill holds a PhD with distinction from the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> He is the author or co-author of six books. His most recent book, we still hear, Pandemic, Policing, Protest and Possibility was published this past November. Since his youth, Dr. Hill has been an activist for social justice. He's worked on campaigns to end the death penalty, abolish prisons and release numerous political prisoners. <clears throat> He's also worked <clears throat> with human rights movements around the world. An award-winning journalist, Dr. Hill has received awards from the National Association of Black Journalists and the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences. Ebony Magazine has named him one of America's 100 most influential Black leaders. A few words about the format tonight. <clears throat> this evening will begin with a brief presentation by Dr. Hill. And then Dr. Hill and Jalen Baker will then have a short conversation with each other, which will be followed by a Q&A session. Please note that in order to submit a question, you'll need to submit it in the chat section of the live stream. Reverend Moss will then provide some closing remarks at the end of the evening. Again, we're honored to have Dr. Hill with us tonight. Welcome, Dr. Hill. Thank you. Thank you so, so much uh, for that generous introduction and for um, an opportunity. Sorry, one second. I think we have a tech. There we go. Thank you, thank you so much for that uh, generous introduction, uh, uh, Dr. Barnes, and also uh, thank you all for uh, the opportunity to be here with you um, to this evening. It is an extraordinary honor uh, to be invited to give any lecture at your esteemed institution, but it is especially uh, exciting and um, overwhelming, in fact, uh, to be invited to give uh, the Martin Luther King lecture. It is um, no secret to many that Martin Luther King um, stands as one of the towering figures in my life, in my personal and political development. Uh, his vision of uh, America, his understanding um, of what's possible for us as a nation, as a political project, as a beloved community, um, continues to be the template for how I think about and understand uh, my own uh, possibilities as a human being, as an activist, as an intellectual. And so I am deeply grateful to have an opportunity to think um, and talk in uh, a space that values Dr. King enough to have a lecture series named after him and to challenge us in, in this trying time, in this extraordinary moment of pain and tumult, uh, to have an opportunity to draw from Dr. King's legacy uh, as a means of not only making sense of the moment, but producing tangible, transformative, actionable responses to this extraordinary moment of chaos. And, and I begin there 
air in my, in my brief remarks, and we'll have plenty of time for conversation, but I want to begin by talking about this extraordinary moment of chaos that we're in. I, I say chaos because like Dr. King said in 68, the world's all messed up. We are wrestling after one of the most important and certainly the most well-engaged uh, elections uh, in our lifetime, in American history, in fact, uh, we're still wrestling with many of the challenges that we wrestled with before. The post-Trump era is an era that, that should not uh, prompt a sense of relief or rest. We can we can smile at the, the progress. We can be excited at the possibilities of what uh, lay in front of us because of 80 million people's decision to go into the polls and usher in a, a, a relatively peaceful transfer of power, uh, January 6th notwithstanding. But what we should be thinking instead is, is that a post-Trump era still leaves us as the richest empire in human history, but an empire nonetheless, where our foreign policy is often marked by war as a primary tactic and strategy. We are the richest empire in human history, and yet children go to bed hungry every single night. We have the capacity to house, to feed, to clothe, to educate, and yet our primary responses to the, to the contradictions of housing inequality and poverty and mental illness and drug addiction is the, is the prison. We continue to build more and more prisons as we shut down mental institutions and drug treatment centers and schools. One of the markers of any democracy ostensibly is our ability to have our rights respected, to have access to uh, human rights, freedom of movement, freedom of speech, safety, free, safety of person, safety of ideas, safety of community. And at this very moment, all of those things are in extraordinary peril, not because of a singular person in the White House, but because of a, a rising fascist and even a rising fascist movement in this country that may be extended in the era of Trump, but certainly didn't begin there. We are in a moment of extraordinary chaos. The, the expansion of rape culture, the expansion of the politics of disposability where we take the most vulnerable among us and instead of investing in them, we find ways to erase them, to delete them, to cage them. We see some of the spaces that were previously, at least in our imaginations, designed to produce democratic possibilities like schools become more and more vulnerable to the same forces that the rest of uh, society has succumbed to. That is to say, we are watching our universities, which were, which were at least in our minds, training grounds for democracy shift into uh, basically technocratic institutions that are largely uh, reflective of the, the imperatives and, and the logics of, of late capitalism. Our, our colleges and universities look more and more like multinational corporations. Our, our, our presidents are looking more and more like CEOs. Our faculty are being, the labor is being casualized. The neighborhoods that the university sits in are being occupied. The students are being overcharged and under delivered. The graduate student labor is being exploited. We are watching so many economic and social and ethical contradictions within the modern university that it is rare as an aside that, that an institution like PTS can stand strong on a tradition of and, and value of intellectual engagement, of democracy, of love, of ethics. We have to shout those places out because they are becoming increasingly rare. This is all reflective of this moment of chaos, but I did not come here this evening to talk about the chaos. The chaos is but one part of this. Rather, like Dr. King, drawing from Dr. King's tradition, I would ask us to consider the response to the chaos of the moment. King, of course, rhetorically asks the question, where do we go from here, chaos or community? I think given our traditions, 
the answer is invariably community. I won't bore you this evening with an argument for why we need to build community rather than turn toward chaos, because I think King also understood that it was unavoidable given our faith traditions, given our uh, ensconcement in the, in the black radical tradition that, that, that turning to community was the answer. The question is not if, the question is how. How do we turn to community in an hour of chaos? How do we engage in radical forms of activism? How do we change? How do we reshape this world against the backdrop of extraordinary levels of chaos? I'm gonna lay out just a few things in the short time I have here that I think will help get us there. And then we can discuss and you can tell me how I'm wrong. The first thing we must do is deploy the radical imagination. Dr. King's tradition is one that is rooted in a fundamental commitment to a belief in an investment in the radical imagination. We must, as Robin Kelly said, hatch or birth freedom dreams. We must imagine worlds that are not yet. We must imagine futures that seem impossible at the current moment. You see, Dr. King, when he stands in Washington in August of 1963, he wasn't merely articulating a vision of what his politics were. He wasn't simply making a demand for America to be multicultural or racially diverse. He wasn't even simply making the demand for America to honor its commitment to the Negro through the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution and the Emancipation Proclamation, those promissory notes that he references in the I Have a Dream speech, the, the vaults of democracy that were empty, the, the check that had been returned insufficient funds, the, the island of poverty amidst the mass ocean of material wealth and prosperity that King referenced were all part of a commitment to get America to honor what it said on paper, to get America to do something special for the Negro, since as he said, it had done something for years against the Negro. This was all part of King's vision. This was all part of King's legacy. This was all part of King's calling. But King was going somewhere deeper. King was standing on the shoulders of Black folk who for decades and indeed centuries had called for America to be something that it had never proven itself to have the capacity to be, to get to produce outcomes that were not promised, to get America and to get Black folk and to get freedom fighters everywhere, to imagine a future that was not locked in to the facts of the present situation. This is what King was saying. King was a student of, 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 excuse me, King was a student of Howard Thurman. King read Howard Thurman closely, the theologian, as you all know, the mystic, the, 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 the great teacher. And in The Growing Edge, Thurman says that we should never scale down our aspirations to the level of the facts in our present situation. Now, 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 now Thurman, of course, was a Christian. So for Thurman, the scandal of the cross when that radical Palestinian Jew named Jesus was subjected to the cruel and unusual punishment and unjust death sentence by the Roman government because of his radical politics. When that moment happens, when the scandal of the cross happens, it is seen for, by many as purely a site of death before Christians. And as Thurman pointed out, it's not merely a site of death. It is in fact the moment where we affirm that God does not allow death to have the last word. And so Thurman says, just as Jesus was not prisoner to the events of the cross, we do not have to be prisoner to the events of our lives. For Thurman, that's not just an individual question. This isn't just a question of theodicy or theology. This isn't an eschatological uh, claim about what's possible at the end of time. No, this was a, an analysis about the current moment. It wasn't merely about the sacred, it was about the secular. He was saying that we don't have to be prisoner of the event. We don't have to be prisoner of the election. We don't have to be prisoner of the statistics. We don't have to be prisoner of a presidency, but rather we can always imagine new and richer possibilities. We can imagine new outcomes. We can imagine new worlds. We can imagine new dreams and we can utter those freedom dreams and then make the word flesh. That means we don't have to dream of warmer and fuzzier prisons. No, 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 no. We don't have to dream of warmer and fuzzier prisons. We can dream of worlds without prisons. We don't just have to have uh, successful Me Too movements. We can imagine a world where we have emptied our minds and our hearts and our spirits 
in our culture of misogyny and patriarchy and homophobia and rape culture such that we don't have the extraordinary levels of harm that are, that are, that are visited upon women, girls and femmes in this country and indeed in this world. We can imagine more ambitious freedom dreams than we ever have. We don't have to be prisoner of the event. That is what King is doing. When he, off, when he utters that dream. That is what King is doing when he produces a poor people's movement. That is what King is doing when he has the courage to speak the truth, even when it is bitter. So we must deploy the radical imagination to be in King's tradition. We must also engage in radical listening. When, when King has his last birthday, He sort of models his ethic of listening, of, of deep and engaged listening. King doesn't just wake up and go to work. He wakes up and he engages Chicano activists. He wanted to figure out how he could build coalitions and thicken the, the, the freedom struggle. He met with uh, sanitation workers in Chicago. One of them had been mauled. He was trying to figure out how to get workers' rights and living wages and safer working conditions. He listened to them. He met with Negro preachers to figure out how they could build on the gains of 64 and 65. He listened to them. He met with anti-war activists trying to figure out how they could stop this thing in Vietnam. He listened to them. For King, the battle of list or the project of listening was not purely about being locked at the arms saying we shall overcome, but also locked at the circumstance. He understood that our coalitions were stronger when we were connected, when we were listening to each other, when we were fighting a united front, when we had a multiracial rainbow coalition of sorts, when we had a multinational, multi-religious engagement, we had a different movement. He understood not just as a Negro preacher, but as the greatest uh, political strategist of the 20th century, King also understood that America would listen to us if the pain of white folk was being uttered. He understood the difference between Bobby Kennedy, uh, or rather John F. Kennedy walking through uh, Harlem in 1963, 1960, holding up a, 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 a black baby, and it's dismissed as a campaign stunt, a, a, a gesture to Adam Clayton Powell. You know how those Northern liberals are. And that stands in sharp contrast to what happens when Bobby Kennedy walks through Appalachia. He holds up that white baby whose belly's bloated and snot's coming out his nose. He's crying, he's hungry, and we begin our war on poverty. King understood that white suffering was less tolerable. This is the deep listening to the pain of those who are different, both for moral and ethical reasons. We wanna, we wanna affirm that the baby in Boston and the baby in Birmingham and the baby in Berlin and the baby in Botswana are all worth the same. That was King's moral, moral agenda. But at the same time, he understood that tactically and strategy, when we listen to each other, when we engage one another, and when we form coalitions, we can build something bigger than what we have when we are separate. And King finally was about courageous action. King didn't just dream ambitious dreams. He didn't just listen to others. He engaged in mass action. When dogs bit us in Birmingham, we bled everywhere. King understood what it meant to organize bus boycotts in 55. He understood what it meant to have a march on Washington for jobs and freedom in 63. He understood what it meant to, to make the courageous call to end the war in Vietnam in the, one of the most important speeches of his life in 67, King understood that, that co courageous action was about joining an organization, holding down an organization, fortifying an organization. King also understood in his tradition that nonviolence as a philosophy, not just as a tactic or strategy like some of us believe, but as a philosophy was an, was an extraordinary form of courageous action. King stabbed before he was shot. King being willing to be beaten, spit on, sh shot at, facing the most violent forms of an American apartheid state. And yet he still continued to hold on to a moral and philosophical vision that said that nonviolence may not stop you from hating me, but it will stop me from hating you. That's its own kind of courage. Courageous action is about speaking the truth, even when it is challenging. King was the most Popular man in America in 1963. He was Time Magazine's Man of the Year, but by 1968, he couldn't get a speech. 
He wasn't getting invited to university campuses. He wasn't, he didn't make People Magazine's most admired Americans list. He was not, uh, he was kicked out of his own Baptist convention. He was not allowed to be on the Morehouse College Board of Trustees. He said he was a bad influence on young people, he said he went to jail too much. This is the profile of someone who spoke truth to power. King understood that to be courageous meant that sometimes you'd stand alone, that sometimes you'd be dismissed by the bourgeois establishment, that sometimes your vindication would come in death, not in life. And so on April 4th, 1968, when King is stolen from us, we didn't just lose an extraordinary speaker or an extraordinary preacher. We didn't just lose one of the great political strategists of all time. We lost in the Christian tradition, we lost America's prophet. We lost America's voice. We lost America's moral compass. And yet, despite that, we have the opportunity to draw on this rich tradition, to draw on his remarkable legacy, to draw on the extraordinary power and promise and possibility of his moral vision and political praxis and still produce the world that is not yet, to still affirm the value of all lives, but especially for this context, all Black lives, for, to, to absolutely articulate a global vision of radical internationalism that challenges racism and poverty and militarism all at once. We have the opportunity to stand on the sturdy shoulders of Martin King. And at this moment of chaos, it just may be our only option. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Um, that was an extraordinary talk, um, extraordinary words by you in helping us reflect on King's legacy. And I cannot wait to dive deeper into conversation about some of your remarks and also some of um, King's words and where they leave us also today. Uh, I wanna remind folks that they can post questions in the chat box for our time of Q&A after Dr. Hill and I are done talking. My name is Austin, awesome. and by the way, my name is Jalen Baker. I am a senior student here at Prince Theological Seminary, completing my Master of Divinity degree, and I also have the privilege of serving as a moderator or president of the Association of Black Seminarians. So Dr. Hill, I kind of, I really just want to dive right into- uh, Let's do it, let's your, do it. Alexis, man, and, and really get, get to it. So I want to begin with this question you take up of King's, right? Where do we go from here? Yeah. Um, one of King's responses to this poignant question, right? He gave this, he gave an answer to this question in 1967 in an essay where he says, first, we must massively assert our dignity and worth, right? He's talking to black folks and particularly the civil rights movement. He says, we must stand up amidst a system that still oppresses us and develop an unassailable and majestic sense of values. We must no longer be ashamed of being black right? That screams Black Lives Matter to me, right? Any movement for Black Freedom King says that overlooks this, this necessity is only waiting to be buried. As long as the mind is enslaved, the body can never be free. Psychological freedom and a firm sense of self is the most powerful weapon against a long night of physical slavery. So Dr. Hill, as you listen to these words of King, how do you think Black Lives Matter has taken up King's words to be a movement that asserts Black dignity and also Black self-worth? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I, I think that Black Lives Matter um, takes that question up in, in multiple ways. Um, on the one hand, it very clearly and powerfully um, asserts the, legitim the, the, the legitimacy of Black lives in the context of state violence. Um, it affirms our worth and it suggests that we can no longer allow the deaths of Black people at the hands of the state to go unnoticed, to go ignored, to go minimized, uh, to get excused. And in many ways, that is a different, and I would argue deeper level of assertion of Black worth than even previous moments, because King is talking about first saying that blackness itself, right? I, think about this at a moment where not only do you have a, 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 an intense black nationalist movement um, that's politically nationalist, but you also have a cultural nationalist movement. Hmm. Um, and some would argue 
quite persuasively, maybe that, that the cultural nationalism is actually what has lingered, right? That I mean, what you're wearing right now is is, is evidence that we have held on to some, some some remnants of cultural nationalism, even at moments where the political project of, of nationalism has failed. Um, and in doing so, we in some ways have affirmed the beauty of black bodies, the the beauty of black culture, the legitimacy of black ways of knowing and being and seeing and worshiping. And black lives, and that's not to say that we don't hold on to white supremacy. It doesn't mean that we don't have self-hate. It doesn't mean that we don't struggle with all the contradictions of being in a white supremacist empire. But what it does mean is that by the time you get to Black Lives Matter, they're beginning with that premise. They're, they're not asserting Black Lives Matter to us, mm -hmm. right? In, in many ways, they're, they're making a call to the state. They're using that to spotlight uh, the violence of the state, the state's failure to mm -hmm. see it, white people's failure to see it even at the moment where the video cameras come out and you are and you are saying, wait a minute, look y'all, we, we're dying. Here it is on tape, but even before it was on tape, we were dying. We've been telling you that before it was on videotape. And so Black Lives Matter is also a, a way of, of, of asserting the value of, of black witness, mm -hmm. right? It's an onto epistemological claim as much as it is uh, in any other. It, it's, it's a very particular type of a way of saying, look, when we say we're getting killed, that should be enough. Black Lives Matter is, um, in that way, standing in that tradition, but extending the work, right? In some ways, it's not, it's not obsessed with convincing white people of our humanity as much as it is saying, stop killing us and demanding principled, humane and, and, and radical, I would argue at times, at their best, uh, responses to the death, as opposed to trying to convince people that I am a man or ain't I a woman, which are important claims to make, which were necessary claims to make, um, and still are. But I, but I see Black Lives Matter as, as, as building on that work and, and, and in some ways living out what, where King was going. Mm. Yeah, thank you. And I think this sort of picks up sort of at the last uh, response King gives us in that 1967 essay, where he, his last response to that question, where do we go from here, is this. He says that we have to honestly face the fact that the movement must address itself to the question of restructuring the whole of American society, right? And this sort of picks up where you uh, talked about this radical imagination, right, that we have to have. And you know, Dr. Hill, as I read this this week, um, this reminded me of something that I heard Joe Biden say recently, right? Biden mm -hmm. said that the majority of Americans aren't looking for a revolution, right? But what they are looking for is progress and a more practical path to getting things done. So it seems to me, Dr. Hill, that Black freedom movements have to always convince the country that we are in need of radical transformation rather than a gradual approach to reformation. Right? How do you think we can continue to push the country, right, to think bolder in its approach to ending injustice rather than just thinking in practical terms? Um, a few things. One, I, I begin by saying, yes, we absolutely need radical change. We need to get at the root of these issues and reform as a philosophy, reform as the strategy will not work. Mm. But we don't want but there are moments where reform tactics and reform strategies are useful as long as they don't undermine our ability to do the work of radical change. You know, this is one of the challenges um, in debates we always have in the prison abolition movement, right? Prison ab we, we want prison abolition, we don't want prison reform. But are there reforms that we could do right now that would advance the cause of abolition or at the very least make people's lives more livable Mm -hmm. At the same time that we comp that we that we that we battle for for these new new worlds, mm -hmm. um, and so the the litmus test often is: Will this reform make people believe that the system is salvageable? Mm -hmm. That's the question we always ask. At least, you know, when it comes to in the abolition context, um, and, and sometimes reforms. I mean, President Obama gave a reform to the federal prison system when he got rid of. Uh, cash bail. Mm -hmm. And when he ended privatization, something that obviously Trump undid and that Biden's trying to redo. But the point is, Trump, uh, Obama's not an abolitionist, but, but cash bail is an abolitionist reform. Mm -hmm. 
right? Because it decarcerates. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is, is that we can do, so, so I'm saying that to say that there are moments where we can be strategic and tactical about even reform and mm -hmm. to not just say, oh, if it's, it's either, uh, we, we either, either we're dismantling everything on today or there's nothing we can get done, but we don't want to convince ourselves or the world that we can tinker our way toward utopia. It cannot happen. It can not happen. And so how do we, to answer the fundamental part of your question, how do we convince people uh, of, that, of that truth? Um, the answer is we have to show the, the ways that the system has failed us, mm. right? We've had to show, we have to show not just that the system uh, yields unjust outcomes, but that it does so by design. It's what, what, like we say, I've said years and now it's become sort of a thing. You know, we have to stop saying that the system is broken and, and that we have to make it work. Instead, we have to say that the system is working just as it's designed. That's right, that's right. And we have to break it. Mm. And that requires, again, the radical imagination. We have to convince people that other worlds are indeed possible. Appealing to history can do can help us, right? When we when we look at slavery, there was no evidence slavery would end. Mm -hmm. It wasn't on an inevitable path toward ending. The cultural logics, the investment in whiteness that that, that white workers had, as Du Bois talked about in, in Black Reconstruction, the, the 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 cotton economy, the I mean, all the logics say we shouldn't be going anywhere. Things can disrupt that. And so showing people new possibilities, exposing them to alternative realities, I think is how we get there. And showing them that, look, the world doesn't catch on fire when we, when, when queer folk get married. The world didn't end when, when marijuana was legalized. The, you know, the world um, continues to go on during COVID when we were able to uh, let out nonviolent offenders and aging populations and we didn't arrest everybody on a petty drug beef, we somehow still managed to keep the world ticking. Why? Because other worlds are possible when we, when we, when we run toward our fear and not away from it. Hmm. And you know, one of the, one of the recommendations um, from activists, Black Lives Matter activists recently at least, to sort of imagine this new world, um, one way to get there has been to defund the police, right? And this has been sort of this explosive recommendation uh, policy claim, right? To defund the police. Yeah. So before we dive deeper into sort of to, to sort of like the practicality of it, I'm wondering if you could sort of walk us through like what does defunding the police actually mean? You know, there are different conversations going on simultaneously about defunding the police um, that mean different things, but defunding the police at a moment was part of a broader, when it, when it emerges, it, it emerges out of a broader conversation that was happening in the prison abolitionist movement where we didn't just want to defund police, we wanted to disarm police, we wanted to, right, there, there were a range of things we wanted to do that, that was a work toward um, abolition, to figure out how we can get to a world without policing in prisons. Um, so, that, so, so we, let me begin there. Uh, what the defunding has movement that has taken the greatest life since the death of George Floyd um, has been, and we saw it in Minnesota, and we've, we saw it in Camden, New Jersey, and we've seen it in other places, um, is, is an initiative designed to literally take the money out of police departments. Ultimately, it, the defunding movement would take all money away from policing, and ultimately we wouldn't need police departments. The current defund movement, or at least where it is at this moment, is not making that, that intense of a demand, but what it is saying is that we have to take money from police departments, defund them, and put the money in other areas of our society such that we can meet people's needs, such that we can reduce harm, such that we can expand safety and peace. Uh, it has become increasingly apparent that policing has become our one size fits all response to all of our social challenges and crises. If the only tool I have is a hammer, then everything is gonna look like a nail. Mm. So someone is addicted to drugs, we call the police. Someone has an overdose, we call the police. There's a domestic dispute, we call the police. Someone's having a mental health episode, we call the police. Some, a cat is stuck in the tree, we call the police. And so, that combined with a tendency for police to engage in pl implicit bias and uh, to have oftentimes to not have a repertoire of tactics that allow for de-escalation. What we often see is police uh, make situations worse than other institutions may have. If someone has an overdose, 
Maybe we need a drug treatment counselor or a social worker, not a police officer. And let's be honest, the police don't want to be dealing with that either. Mm. Um, and, and what we've essentially done is we've made the police do everyone's job. Mm -hmm. So even if you like police and value police, it's not fair to the police either. Mm -hmm. So we have to reimagine this thing. I'll give you one quick example. In Philadelphia, Walter Wallace was killed uh, in November. And he was killed in West Philadelphia. He was holding a knife um, and the police shot and killed him. And again, thinking about expanding our, our, our imaginations and, and thinking about the world that is not yet, the, the debate, the public debate was, should the police have shot Walter Wallace or not? You know, is it unreasonable to ask police to not shoot someone who's charging at them with a knife? And this becomes the debate. And the problem with that debate is you could make a persuasive argument that if someone's charging at you with a knife and you have a gun, that you should shoot them. But what it ignores is the fact that Walter Wallace should not have been in a position to be charging at police with a knife, that his mom should not have been in a position where um, when her son is having a mental health episode, the only person she can call and get a response from from, from, the, from the state is an armed police force. Walter Wallace should have been able to access a mental health resource that would have met his needs long before he had this particular breakdown on this particular day, which was the third one in like 24 hours. So all of this is to say that we can't, as Thurman said, reduce our aspirations to the facts that are our that that to the <clears throat> that we can't scale down our, our, our dreams um, or our aspirations to the level of the facts in our present situation that we have to be able to imagine something else and so I begin always by saying what would the world look like both your personal world and our collective world if all of your needs were being met and for me, that's the place to begin deploying the radical imagination. What would the world look like if all of our needs were being met? And I think, Dr. Hills, for so many, for so much of the country, um, that world has always included the police, right? And I think folks struggle with, in some ways, right? I think you can get folks to say police violence is wrong, right? Police killings is wrong. So why can't we just get rid of police violence and police killings and keep the institution of the police as it is, right? What are, you, what, are, what, are you, what are your thoughts on that? That presumes that the police have a social and structural function that extends beyond that. Mm. It's, it, you know, it's like, can we have nation states without violence? No, no, that's what nation states do, right? They plunder, they destroy, they, they, they colonize, they war. It's what they do. Mm -hmm. um, can we have policing in this country that is disconnected from its history of protecting the interests of the, of, 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 of the wealthy class, of the elites? Can we have one that's not mm -hmm. rooted in violence against Black folk, one that's not disconnected from slave patrols? And, mm -hmm. and I mean, the, the, the question is, is, is an interesting one, um, but I don't believe that it is possible. I would mm. love to have policing without the violence. But that suggests again that, there, that policing is about bad apples, that, right? That if we could just take the bad apples out or if we could just tweak the recipe, we could, we could, produce, a, we could, we could produce a product that tastes better or that, and that ultimately is better. But what if it is the, in, the ingredients themselves, mm. right? Mm. What if the things that constitute this larger thing are themselves deeply and fundamentally and irreparably Problematic. The police. The, it, it, we. It, there's something though about policing that we're less willing to even consider that possibility. There's people all over the world that'll say, you know, public school sucks. It's not the individual teachers. I have plenty of teachers who are smart, who are great, who I like, who I'm. You know, my my mama was a teacher. You know, whatever. <laughs> But the system is so dysfunctional that it can't produce the kind of outcomes we want. People say that all the time. But when it comes to the police, they just want to tweak, 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 and not allow for the possibility that even if your favorite uncle is a cop, the problem may not be your favorite uncle. It may be the system that your favorite uncle is in and the kind of people you can even be in the context of these systems, right? What kind of, what kind of cop can I be? You know, we can't behave our way out of this. We have to reimagine the system itself. That's right. That's right. Thank you. 
So I want to shift the conversation a little bit, and I want to talk about the role of the Christian church, right, sort of within the Black Lives Matter movement. And Dr. Hill, as I was reflecting on this sort of question or topic, I came across some of King's words on this subject, and I find them really interesting. I want to run them by you. So King talks about how during the civil rights movement, in order for the church to have a role, they had to become more militant, right? And he says that this actually happened because you began to see preachers being willing to be arrested for protesting. And you also saw churches raise funds for carpools and transportation, for example, during the Montgomery bus boycotts. So we saw back then how Christian churches, right, mostly black churches to be fair, found a way to stand in solidarity with that movement. In what ways, Dr. Hill, can you sort of imagine the church today standing in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement? I mean, we see the Black Lives Matter movement and the Black church standing side by side in many instances, right? I mean, I think we sort of overstated the death of the Black church with regard to activism and movements. Um, when we were in Ferguson, we certainly saw um, how things were moving. We saw signposts of shifts. The, 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 the BLM uh, movement was no longer, was not centered in the church. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there wasn't a-, a, 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 that, is, a that, that is a key difference, right? That is a key yeah. difference. It wasn't centered in the church, but it doesn't mean the church didn't play a part, right? Mm -hmm. Reverend Sekou was on the front lines. Cornell West was on the front lines, getting it with the collar on though, right? Not just as, act, as activists, but also as, as lay preacher, right? Um, William Barber, Moral Mondays, right? Frontline stuff we're talking about here. So I, I, I don't want to frame it as if the black church is sort of in the stands watching BLM. The black church is bound up in it in all mm. sorts of ways. Mm. Um, so so I, I would begin there. Um, at the same time, yeah, it's an increasingly secular movement. It's an increasingly secular country. It's an increasingly secular community. Absolutely. Um, which is fascinating. It's something we have to reckon with. Mm. Um, we have to, the black church has to think about um, how it can play a role when it's no longer the center. Same, you know, same thing we tell white people, right? What do you want to do when you're not in charge? Mm. What kind of, you know, what, what can black churches do? I, I think part of it comes down to what our political agenda is, what our ideologies are. Because if we still have black churches chasing faith-based faith -based funds or, or scapegoating queer folk, as a means of advancing uh, this, this ridiculous conservative um, political ideology and theology, then, then, then we're not gonna get anywhere, right? The, the, church, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement has made it very clear that it is a diverse, intersectional, uh, internationalist movement. And the Black church is going to have to take those, those issues and those questions up. Uh, when Aubrey Hendricks writes The Politics of Jesus, and he takes us to the book of Luke, and he talks about what it means to preach good news to the poor, to heal the, to heal the captive, or, or to free the captive, to heal the broken heart, right? What, what it means to do this in the context of a Jubilee year. What does it mean to think about the politics of Jesus, not purely as metaphor or symbol, but as an actual attempt to check unjust power, to actually be willing to be an enemy of the state, to actually return land to folk when, in a year where it was taken, to actually free those who are caged to think about those politics as central to the politics of the church is to align oneself with black lives matter it doesn't then you're not then you're not jumping far but the problem is the, the mainline black church um in many ways has embraced uh doctrines that are counter to the liberatory vision of black lives matter that are counter to the uh the the the, the uh liberation theology tradition that are counter to the kind of Marxist Christian traditions that we saw in Latin America. We, we're, we're watching them move further and further and further away from the traditions that would make this not a stretch at all, but simply what we do. Mm. Um, and so I think the black church has to also be critical and reflective of where it is, of what its beliefs are, of what its practices are, and, and how it in a moment of extraordinary, not just proto-fascism, but also neoliberalism, has in many ways in, in embraced a, 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 a gospel of neoliberalism, right? A neoliberal theology that links faith and merit uh, and, 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 and health uh, and prosperity, right? To the whims of the market, mm. to individual wealth, to 
to, 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 to how much money you got, to how much money your preacher got, mm. right? This, this becomes, um, and, and that's not, to, and I don't, I, don't, I don't mean to be nostalgic or pretend that we didn't have that, you know, that, that Creflo Dollar started this or, 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 or we, we saw Reverend Price die a couple of weeks ago, that, that, that these are the movements. We had Reverend Ike's back in the day. We've always had these movements, but what happens when they move from the margin to the center? Mm. You know, what happens when the mega church, right? Which again, neoliberal project, right? That the mega church, and say with that, 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 that Target and Walmart swallow up mom and pop stores, that the mega church eats up these smaller churches where, where that were yeah. moving to a community, moving to a social justice as they always had. You, so now you got 5,000 people in a church and the gospel is, you know, God meant me to drive a Bentley, right? So if that's the if that's the narrative, then yes, the, the church has way as a ways to go to close that gap, right? Um, but if we begin to, to use the a kind of a barian conception of theodicy, if we were to say that the that the that 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 the gap between destiny and merit is closed by how much money I tithe, then that moves counter to a Black Lives Matter movement, which is not only trying to keep track of Black uh, life against the backdrop of a violent state, but it's, it's forcing us to reimagine what state violence looks like beyond police that shoot us, but also uh, systems that put lead in our water, schools that deprive us of, of, of an education, uh, of, of, of the denial of food, clothing, and shelter, safety, dignity, and self-determination for everyday people in this country. Black Lives Matter saying, if we're going to affirm the value of Black lives, we have to affirm them in all of these sectors of our lives. But if the church becomes, becomes silent on these matters mm -hmm. and thinks that the only moral issues that must be raised are issues around birth control, stem cell research, and gay marriage, and don't see poverty as a moral question, that mm -hmm. don't see police violence as a moral question, that don't see Amazon and, the, you know, and, 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 and kind of Corona capitalism, as I talk about my, and, and we still hear as moral questions. If we only see the moral questions as those things I mentioned, then again, we have lost any, I would say political and moral legitimacy as an institution, mm. whoever we are, whether we're Muslims, Christians, Jews, what have you, but well, we're talking about the black church today. And so, so I think that's something we have to pay uh, careful attention to. Absolutely. And I, I kind of want to dig into this a little bit. I, I ask two more questions and then we move into the Q&A, right? So in your book, We Still Here, I was struck by your conversation about the role of Black, of black elected officials, right, in the struggle for Black freedom. You say that because they spend so much time spinning their wheels, working with limited resources and trying to stay in office, they are, uh, they are unable to take radical steps in legislation which leads you to believe that black politicians are not the people positioned to lead us to liberation. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts on black preachers, pastors, and clergy persons, right? Well, like when we think about black, black pastors, right? Does she have the right platform? Does she have, in some ways, the right pulpit that could be sort of a means to our liberation. What are your thoughts on that? I, I was struck by that conversation you had in your book. I, I believe that there is space in politics to resist. Baldwin talked about, um, I think about Baldwin's conversation about, you know, what, what, for, you know, what happens when Reagan's on the ticket in 1980. Baldwin talked about voting as a means of buying time. Mm. We don't believe in this. We don't. I don't think that Jimmy Carter is going to save my life. I, I don't think he's ideal. But this is a means for Black folk of buying more time to fight another day. And so, any any sort of skepticism, awareness I have of, of, of Black politicians is not to suggest that I don't think we need them. Mm -hmm. um, but that, yeah, they get elected to get reelected. And it's hard to have a radical agenda in, as a member of as a member of the House of Representatives when you're getting we basically always on campaign, <laughs> and if not, they primary you, right? So we have to think about that. And then, and so the church, in some ways, is free of that those kind of constraints. Mm -hmm. um, but again, if it's driven by a kind of market logic, there are other questions that we have to think about. Mm -hmm. Because preaching, I, I know plenty of pastors who, who, who believe 
uh, that people should marry who they want, but they know it's bad for business to preach that. They know that telling women why they don't have a man and, and how God is going to, you know, deliver them a man if they just do X, Y, and Z. That's good for business. Telling people they're going to hell is good for business. Speaking out against the occupation of Palestine is bad for business. And so many pastors are not going to take those issues up, the most, the most, the most pressing in many ways issues of our day, simply because they're driven by a market logic. It's not about any, it's not about being controlled by any particular issue. It's about just simply saying, my congregation wants something else. And so I'm gonna give them that thing, even if it doesn't reflect my morals, my values, and my politics. That's the, that's the danger, but at its best, at its best, the black church is that space. Mm. That pulpit, as you reference, is the space. I mean, think about how David Walker's appeal was read. You know, that's how you end up with a Nat Turner's rebellion. You need those kinds of documents that are critiquing white Christianity, that are challenging the state, and that are asserting a moral claim. We need that. And so, yeah, I think the, the church absolutely has the potential yes. to, 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 to be a space of liberation and transform, transformation. It has been. Mm -hmm. But not all churches. Mm. We got to be mindful, again, of what's being put out into the world from that pulpit. Mm. Um, but yeah, I, I have extraordinary faith that uh, the pulpit, the the minbar, you know, where where, where, where Muslims give their khutbah. Um, I believe that those spaces are incredibly important. I believe that whether you're a black Jew, a black Christian, a black a black Muslim, a black atheist, a black agnostic, there's all kinds of spaces where we can do this work outside of politics. Again, doesn't mean we don't care about the politics, but the politics will catch up with us. Politicians don't have feelings; they have interests, and if our in, and if our interests can when our interests converge with theirs, that's when they do the work. And so, if we're on a radical agenda, if we're on a radical type time, they will be. That's great, and I think uh, Dr. Hill will end our conversation for now there, and we'll turn to Q and A. Thank you so much for all of your remarks. It's my you. pleasure. Um, so one person has a question, Dr. Hill saying, thinking of King's thoughts of the dilemma of white America, how do whites in America untether themselves from the, from the emotional tie to the system that is, preventing the, that is preventing the birth of new worlds? And I actually kind of want to expand on this question, Dr. Hill, exactly. because you actually talk a little bit about this in your book, We Still Here, right? Yeah. You say that white folks are committed to worshiping a lie. Right. And this lie you talk about, right, racist myth, compelling evidence uh, that, that racism is alive and well with us. Right. They are so committed to worshiping this lie that the truth cannot even convert them. Right. So you talk about this a little bit in your book. And I think this question is along those lines. Right. So so what is your response to this? You know, and I also think about Eddie Glaude's wonderful book on Baldwin, Begin Again. Um, where he talks extensively about this idea of the lie and, and, and what America's investment is, even at its own peril, in, in believing in certain kinds of lies of American exceptionalism, of, 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 of American uh, moral achievement. Um, I think that it's a wonderful question. I, I, I think that for white people to be successful allies and to successfully dismantle this thing, they have to be willing to not just utter words or be self-critical, but to actually surrender power. Mm. You know, the problem is everybody wants to go to heaven, don't nobody want to die, right? So it's like, oh, I want this world to be just, but I also don't want to truly let go of this privilege. I still want my whiteness to matter I still want these power dynamics to play out. I don't want to lose anything. But, and, and that's the problem when you have such longstanding imbalances of power is that unfortunately, yeah, the white people are gonna lose something and that's okay. But somehow white discomfort um, becomes the, 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 the legitimate excuse for not engaging in the work that needs to be done. 
And so for white people, I think you have to be honest about yourself and say, how, what am I willing, what am I really willing to sacrifice to be for black folk to be free? And am I willing to do it? Mm. A lot of times the answer is no. Mm. You know, I think Dr. Hill too, that it's important for white pastors, white church leaders to ask that question that you bring up in this powerful quote here is like, what lies are we worshiping here? Right. Uh, what lies are we worshiping here? And how can I, as a church leader, tell the truth that you're worshiping a lie so that you can be brought out of it, right? Because I think that's something you bring up Baldwin and Glaude. Baldwin is so eloquent in saying that racism is just as much about white people than it is for black people, right? Like you have to be saved from it, right? And I think white churches have to really get into this sort of pattern of saying we have to save ourselves. From racism, not let alone saving black people, we have to be saved, right? right. And I just think that that's a, it's, it's a powerful thing to think that if the truth can't convert me, man, I must be doing something wrong. So I think that was just a powerful, powerful line you had there. No, oh, thank you. And 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 I, and I think ultimately, it's it, that's the reckoning that has to happen. White people have to really ask themselves what they're willing to lose. Mm. They have to they have to identify the lie itself though, right? They have to convince themselves, they have to recognize that that who we are as a country is not because of some exceptionalism. Mm -hmm. And that what our possibilities are as a collective nation are directly hinging upon what they're willing to sacrifice. Mm. Um, they have to recognize that their whiteness has opened doors, that their whiteness has played a role. Not to mean that they're not talented and wonderful and beautiful and amazing and all that stuff, but they have to understand that. At the, at the same time, they understand that black folk have been held behind uh, and disadvantaged because of the, they're not white. White folk have been advantaged by that, but that's part of the problem, right? Is that then you start questioning yourself, well, well who am I? And this is what Toni Morrison talked about, right? Well, who am I from, if we take all the stuff away, who am I? Am I any good? Mm. Am I talented? Am I smart? Am I beautiful? And these are questions that people have to wrestle with. Yeah. 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 We had, we, had an, uh -oh. we had another question here, Dr. Hill. One person says, King writes, injustice must be exposed um, with all the tension its exposure creates. How important is this to do still in a post-Trump age? You went out. Can you say that one more time? How important is it to expose what? Sorry about that. Uh, let me ask one more time. Injustice must be exposed with all the tension its exposure creates. How important is this to do, to do this still in a post-Trump age? Exposing injustice despite all the, the messiness and drama and mm -hmm. I, it's the most important. Right. You know, Hakim Adabudi wrote a wonderful uh, collections of poems um, called uh, Run Toward Fear. We have to run toward our fear um, these are difficult moments and exposing the contradictions of empire right now is an even more urgent and important call uh, than, um, than maybe during the era of Trump. I remember being in, in DC protesting the Iraq war and I remember how many people were so vocal against George W. Bush and I, and I, I remember thinking how sharply that contrasted with those folk who said nothing as, 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 as Obama plundered the Middle East and, and had sent predator drones to Yemen and Afghanistan and, and Somalia. I, I remember thinking about how important it was for us to keep the intensity going during the Obama moment. We naturally have our backs up when Bush is president. We super got our backs up when Trump is president. But so much of what happens, so much of the violence, so much of the of, of, of the of the inequality and the injustice emerges at these moments of relative calm. Mm. Right? We have to examine and unpack that calmness and figure out what is really happening under the surface. And I think that at a moment right now to, to, to call out Joe Biden for his politics on, in Africa or his 
response to the minimum wage and his willingness to be somewhat negotiable on that in a way that he said he wouldn't be, his failure to to even advocate, to even acknowledge defunding as a legitimate possibility, his, his moving away from Green New Deals or Medicare for All. Now it's like, oh, we can't do that now. We can do that all the time with Trump, but with Biden, and this is this is a polite company and, 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 and this is awkward, right? But it's that awkwardness um, that will produce change. It, it is the discomfort. It is the drama and the tension and the, and that comes from exposing injustice, as you pointed out, that will get us somewhere. And we have to be willing to do that even when it is most difficult, especially when it's most difficult. Thank you. And this will be the last question and then we'll um, end our time together tonight. So Dr. Hill, you talked about in your brief remarks and also eloquently in your book, We Still Hear, this idea that we have to adopt this abolitionist vision and imagination to enact what you call, or what you really borrow from black feminist traditions, uh, impossible futures, right? So I imagine Dr. Hill that sort of doing this work of enacting impossible futures, one must have a robust practice of hope, right? Yes. And I'm wondering, what is your practice of hope? And how do you maintain it, even when our struggle can at times seem futile? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a prisoner of hope because we've stepped out on nothing so many times and landed on something. Mm. You know, I, I think history um, gives us reason to be hopeful, not to be optimistic, <laughs> not to believe that things just gonna work out, not to have a kind of naive kind of philosophy of how, of, of, of how the world moves, but to believe as, as old folks you say in the church, I do not have to be what I once was. Mm -hmm. That's right. That, that, that's always against the odds. That's always against all evidence to the contrary, right? It requires a certain kind of positioning in the world. We have to make a, we have to hold something down. And you think about William R. Jones when he asked the question, is God a white racist, right? He's saying, maybe we should challenge the syllogism itself and ask whether God is even on your side. Mm. But, uh, but, but, but I think liberation theology gives us enough sort of moral and philosophical armor to say, and our faith traditions to say, no, God is on this God, if we, God is on the side of the oppressed. And once we, once we operate from that place, um, I think history gives us reason to believe that we'll be victorious. Mm. Slavery was overcome against all evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. Suffrage was achieved against all evidence to the contrary. Mm -hmm. And so the battles we're fighting now, it's uphill. We're fighting, we're clawing, we're losing sometimes. But my, my practice of hope is rooted in, in that history and that knowledge that is that people have done a whole lot more with a whole lot less. Mm, Jesus. And so I practice it through action. I practice it by doing the work that will allow a, a kind of a vision of hope, a radical imagination to be deployed. In other words, I, I dream of the worlds that are not yet, but I'm also fighting to create them. Mm -hmm. I'm not just imagining a world without prisons. I'm trying to write them into existence. I'm trying to teach them into existence. I'm trying to organize them into existence. I'm trying to protest them into existence. And I don't know if we'll get there, but that was King's point in 68. I don't know if I'll make it there, but we as a people will, and that's enough. Mm. And so, and even if it's not, it's like the Pascalian wager, right? Even if it's not, I would have lived a life of care and love and mercy and justice that is rich enough and full enough that it warrants this work one way or the other. Dr. Hill, thank you so much for coming to Princeton Seminary. You have blessed us on tonight on um, being our MLK lecturer this year. We applaud you, we appreciate you. And I think I speak for so many, um, just so many young black folks that you have inspired us beyond measure to keep on keeping on, to keep fighting, keep struggling. And uh, please continue to still be a light and remain a light for all of us and lead us forward. Thank you so much, Dr. Hill. Okay, We're going to now toss it over to 
our interim director for the Center of Black Church Studies, Kermit Moss, and he's gonna offer us closing remarks and take us home. Kermit, please take it away. Thank you, Jalen. So on behalf of the Center for Black Church Studies and Princeton Theological Seminary, we first wanna thank Dr. Hill for a profound conversation, fantastic remarks and a great lecture. Thank you very much. We also wanna thank the Association of Black Seminarians for a great event. And we wanna celebrate Jalen for facilitating a really, really wonderful conversation. We also wanna thank each of you for your presence this evening at our Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture at Princeton Theological Seminary. And as we close, I wanna leave us with these words. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the time is always right to do what's right. So as we prepare to close tonight, let's do right. Let's build a beloved community. Let's work for the transformation of the world. Why? Because it's the right thing to do and now is the right time. So go and dream freedom dreams and go make the dream a reality. Good night and God bless you.